Hello, my name is Jim, and today we're going to be talking about uh, power supplies part one. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to start with a half wave rectifier circuit, and uh, these aren't used very much at all in electronics anymore. Common place they used to be used was in CRT based high voltage supplies, but there are better, more efficient uh, rectifier topologies, so we're just going to start here so we can understand some of the basics. So this is a diode used as a rectifier, and this is not NOT, a light emitting diode. So this is just a regular silicon diode. And if you recall from before, when the anode is positive with respect to the cathode, that would be in this sense, the diode is forward biased and you have a current flow. And when the anode is negative with respect to the cathode, it looks like an open circuit and the current flow is zero. So if we assume a perfect diode, now what that simply means is last time we talked about a diode in quadrant one which uh, went over here say to 2.2 volts for a light emitting diode and then we treated it like that, the 2.2 volt drop. And for a perfect diode all that means is that if we're uh, going positive here, positive voltage, as soon as we get positive it's going to start to conduct. Now the reason we're doing that is I don't want the forward drop of a forward bias diode to obscure the theory of what we're doing here in power supplies. <clears throat> and many times it doesn't actually affect the circuit that much anyhow. So I've shown some batteries here and what we're going to do is migrate to a sinusoidal source which has a positive and negative component. So uh, this is going to be our load resistor, uh, it could be a light bulb, it could be a piece of radio equipment, audio equipment, whatever. We're just using a resistor here. And I've broken the sine wave down into quadrants. Quadrants 1 and 2 are positive, and quadrants 3 and 4 are negative. And uh, this would be the 360 degree point, and the 180 degree point, and so forth. So, if we place a diode in the circuit, <coughs> the uh, anode is going to be more positive than the cathode only during quadrants 1 and 2. So the diode is going to conduct and then what we're going to see across the resistor is the voltage which is being passed through the diode. Now on the second half of the waveform 3 and 4 uh, the diode is going to be reverse biased and uh, no current is going to flow and hence what we end up with is a straight line over to the 360 degree point and then for the next cycle it will repeat itself. So we're going to get a series of half cycles out of a half wave rectifier. <coughs> now if I like to put the diode in backward, and I should not use the word reverse because that sounds wrong. In this case, what we're interested in here is to have a negative voltage at the output and sometimes we need to do that. But uh, what we see now is that the anode is going to be positive in quadrants 3 and 4. And that would be when our waveform in quadrants 3 and 4 would produce a polarity for the sine wave source of that um, polarity. And what we see in the output then would be a negative half cycle pulse, uh, which would be conducting when the diode is forward biased in quadrants 1 and 2. And I'll just put a plus here real quick and a minus here, as we can see that the cathode is going to be more positive than the anode and the diode is not going to conduct, hence there's no output when the, uh, <coughs> the source is in quadrants 1 and 2. Now to take a look at a diode, and um, let me try to hold this up here so you can see it well. There it is. Oops. <coughs> what I'd like you to notice is that there's a band on the left side of this, and this is typical for identifying diodes, and that band is the cathode. So the cathode would be banded, and that's the way you tell the polarity by a little band over on the cathode side. You know, this diode is really large, and it's a high voltage diode. I think I was uh, building an uh, uh, electronic air cleaner at the time with a neon sign transformer. <coughs> Not such a good idea, I suppose. But uh, you can have positive or negative outputs depending upon whatever it is you need for whatever project you're building or designing or whatever. 
So, if we take a look at our basic circuit again, is um, what we see is what we saw before, and now we're looking at multiple output pulses, and then the missing component would be the negative part of the sine wave, which would be down here. I've not shown it, and I shouldn't show it, because when it doesn't connect, conduct rather, then the point between these two is going to be at zero volts. And this would be picking up a peak of 10 volts again, assuming a perfect diode. So, in the commercial world here, home residential, uh, this is 60 hertz approximately, and that line frequency varies a little bit up and down, but over the long run, it's error is zero. And uh, if we found the period of that, we would find that it would be 16.7, or more correctly, 16.6 repeat milliseconds, where T would be equal to 1 over F, 1 over the frequency. So this kind of output, although it is DC, is not really too useful for most electronic components. It would produce terrible hum and audio equipment, as you can imagine. So what we're going to do is put in a filter cap. <clears throat> now notice that I've taken the load out, which isn't realistic again, but it'll kind of give us a first start on this. So we're going to say that I start this at this point, and this is the rising voltage of the front end of the sine wave, and it reaches the peak, and it is charging the capacitor in this sense. And when the capacitor becomes charged, and the voltage drops, say, to here, what that means is that the cathode is going to be more positive than the anode at this point. In other words, the cap cannot discharge backward through the diode. As soon as this become, starts to fall, the cathode is more positive than the anode. And since we don't have a load connected here, the capacitor has no way of getting rid of its charge. It is simply going to sit at 10 volts as a straight line. So that's very nice. That's what we'd like to see out of a half-wave supply with a load attached is a straight line with no ripple components in it. So <clears throat> there's no place to discharge for the capacitor. It can charge, but it cannot discharge. Now while we're here, it's a good time to talk about, and um, this is before we put a load on because that just confuses things a little bit, the peak reverse voltage or the peak inverse voltage, and both of these mean the same thing, rating of a diode. Now what that's about is how much voltage can the diode stand in this polarity, plus to minus, that's reverse bias before it breaks, before you rip electrons out of orbit in a reverse bias junction, and then you end up with what's called breakdown. Breakdown is typically high current, and high voltage equals high power, equals burn up part. So um, what's the maximum reverse voltage across the diode, and let's take a look at this because the output may be a little bit uh, surprising. Um, <clears throat> in this particular case here, we're looking at 120 volts RMS, which is standard uh, household uh, voltage for your outlets. And uh, multiplying that by 1.414, we find that that's going to be 169 volts peak. Now, in this case, we're charging the capacitor, and you charge in this polarity up to 169 volts. That would be the peak of the input. Again, there's no place for that capacitor to discharge. So what happens is that if we look at the absolute worst case, which is right down here, negative 169, we're going to see at the, on the next page that these are going to be series aiding. And what that means is that the actual voltage across the diode is going to be a whopping 338 volts. Now you'd think operating, say, with a peak of 169, that a 200 volt diode would work. But when you add up the effect of the supply with the charge on the capacitor, it actually ends up being a lot more than the peak of the input voltage. <coughs> So uh, kind of explaining that here again, only this time we're using 10 volts. And uh, if I take a snapshot of this waveform right here and replace it by a 10 volt battery, is what we see is this is negative with respect to ground. And that if we look at the polarities here, plus and minus, these are in fact series aiding. And importantly, 
that means that the voltage across the diode here is going to be 20 volts, which is approximately twice the peak voltage of uh, the source voltage. <coughs> so what we've done here is at that instant in time, we just substituted in a battery, if you will, to allow us to concentrate on that instant of time. So you have to be very careful when you're designing that you don't exceed the PRV, PIV, because if you do, bad things can happen. If they break down and fail short, you're putting AC on your electronic equipment. Not good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, some other language here, and we're seeing the RMS with the peak. I guess pretty much covered that. So we have a perfect diode, and now what we're going to do is we're going to add a load, and resistors aren't too exciting as loads, but this could represent uh, a camera, um, audio equipment, MP3 player, whatever. So we're just going to show it as a resistor, and then what we see here is that, and I've just turned this on, turned the switch on here, is in quadrant one, is that the capacitor charges up to the peak voltage here, again, assuming a perfect diode. And then what happens is, is as soon as the voltage input starts to drop, the capacitor cannot discharge backward through the diode, but it certainly can discharge through the load. And as it does so, the capacitor discharges. Now, on the next positive cycle of the uh, power source, it's going to reach a point where it is going to be more positive than the voltage on the capacitor. So the source is now going to charge the capacitor and also deliver some current to the load. The capacitor will be charged again at the maximum and as soon as it starts to drop, the capacitor cannot discharge back through the diode, but it can discharge through the load and we get this here effect. The reason this is drooping is the load is um, removing the charge from the capacitor. So, the capacitor charges in this time period when you see the discharge intersect the pulse coming from the rectifier and the ends charge as soon as that pulse starts to go negative. And if we think about it, we have to supply current to the load all the time. But, we're only charging the capacitor during this amount of time. So we have to have a large current spike that not only supplies the load in this time, but it allows the capacitor to deliver charge over a considerable amount of time. Now remember that the sum of this has to be equal to the period 16.6 repeat. So when we charge a capacitor, we can get some really, really large voltages, uh, currents rather, that have to be averaged out over time as this discharges. So this is a wear out phenomenon for a capacitor and uh, I might uh, discuss this here. You might find this interesting, especially if your television is broken. This is an example of a uh, radio capacitor. And uh, you see the X in the top, and that's to allow venting in case this overheats. And this is rated at um, 1,000 microfarad and 63 volts. And if you have a flat screen TV or a LCD monitor that fails, it might be worth to take the time to set it down on the carpet and uh, take the back off. Good luck with that. It's probably harder than fixing it. And what you want to look for is a top on a cap that's bulged out. And that's a sure indication that that cap is wearing out. As the capacity drops, what will happen is, is that the ripple will increase eventually your uh, your TV will fail. So um, you could save some money by replacing a part that costs maybe three dollars. Now what I haven't told you is that television sets and a lot of equipment use what's called switch mode power supplies. Instead of operating at 60 Hertz they can be operating at uh, 100,000 Hertz. And it's a special type of capacitor you need to put in there that costs more. So um, this year is rated 105 degrees. This is a very high quality cap. If you have any questions about that, uh, you'll see me in class. But a lot of appliances can be fixed because a filter capacitor takes a lot of beating. I mean, we wouldn't think that, but it does. It's beat up a lot. 
So this is dial current. <clears throat> so um, let's talk about here this ripple. And ripple is very basically a variation from ideal is caused by the capacitor discharging during part of the cycle. So the ripple voltage peak to peak is simply going to be the difference between the peak voltage and the valley voltage here. And uh, what we want that to be basically is zero. So the smaller it is, the better it is. And the industry, of course, has to have a way of measuring and quantifying things. So they define the ripple factor as V ripple RMS. A little issue there. Over VDC average times 100% and a ripple factor of zero um, is a very good thing. Okay, so that's, that's the ripple factor. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. <clears throat> so here we've got a typical half weight circuit with a, a load on it and a filter capacitor which can be quite large and the ripple voltage will decrease as the value of C increases. So you can reduce ripple voltage by increasing the size of the capacitor. The problem with that is that, if I go back here, the ripple will decrease, but so will the conduction time. So the capacitor will have to charge with a much, much higher current. And there's practical limits to doing that. So we can get a little... Um, benefit by increasing the capacitor as long as we're reasonable or we can uh, uh, increase um, RL. So if we increase the load, uh, you have to be very careful there, uh, decrease the load, that's actually an arrow going down. I made my own mistake here. What that means is that if we decrease the load, the load resistance increases. So we're decreasing the load on the circuit. And if we want uh, V ripple to increase, can't think of a good reason why, is that we can decrease the value of C, and that decrease can come because it's failing, or increase the load, meaning that the resistance goes down. You're drawing more current, and hence the capacitor will discharge faster. So when you're troubleshooting, the place you want to start is the power supply, because if it's not working, well, chances are nothing else is going to be working either then there's always a possibility that some circuit downstream is causing problems in the power supply. And uh, sometimes I've cut foil trying to identify where that fault was. I couldn't see anything. Things measured or seemed to okay with an ohmmeter. And that's uh, part of the uh, troubleshooting. So the only thing we have kind of dangling on this right now is to find the uh, V ripple in RMS and we need that for the ripple factor equation. And uh, note that 707 will not work here, uh, 0 0.707, because this is not a sine wave. But if we take the peak voltage of the ripple, and this is where the AC coupling mode on a scope comes into play, this can be riding on top of 100 volts and be 10 volts. And if we push AC, it gets rid of the DC component and it allows us to expand this so we can make a granular measurement. And it's very easy to measure once we get rid of the DC component. So that's why scopes have AC and DC coupling. So this looks pretty much like a sawtooth wave and um, it's not hard to find the RMS of a sawtooth wave using um, uh, calculus because the line is, the equation is very simple. Y equals MX plus B. It's not at all hard to do, but what that comes out to be is the amplitude expressed here as A divided by the square root of 3. And uh, that will allow us to find the ripple factor of the power supply. Now, coming up in part 2, we're going to talk about a very universal type of replacement or upgrade for this called a bridge rectifier. And uh, instead of having an output frequency, uh, let me go back here. Yes, it's okay. The output frequency of this is 16.7 milliseconds, and that means that the hum, the ripple, is going to be a 60 hertz uh, component. Now, when we get into a bridge rectifier, what we'll see is we're going to take the negative part of the waveform and fill in the gap. 
so the frequency is 120 hertz and a lot easier to filter. So that will be coming up in part two. Bridge rectifiers are um, very, very common. They use four diodes and uh, diodes are very cheap unless they're very specialized diodes. So that's it for halfway circuits and thank you for listening.